Hi, Jerry Corley again, Stand Up Comedy Clinic. Let's cover today the eight or nine laughter triggers. What I like to do at the Stand Up Comedy Clinic is I like to break comedy down to a science, actually it's scientific elements. First of all, uh, I break it down into the nine triggers for human laughter. They're actually psychological triggers that make human beings laugh. Did you know this? Uh, one of them is tickling. So let's remove that because it's not applicable to what we do. And now we have eight laughter triggers at a psychological level that make humans laugh. So once we understand these, think about how powerful it could be in helping you to write your comedy. And I'll give you an example a little, little uh, further in the, into this video. Let's start with the number one laughter trigger, that's surprise. Surprise is the number one trigger for human laughter. We create surprise, we can make somebody laugh. Number two is embarrassment. Uh, we laugh at embarrassment, embarrassing situations. Number three is recognition. Very powerful, utilized a lot by most of the comics you see today on Comedy Central and on the late night shows. Uh, recognition is where we take an incident, a situation, a word, a phrase uh, that has been used and we reanimate it while we're on the stage and put it into a situation that we all recognize and sort of just shine the light on it, put it under a magnifying glass for the audience, and they go, oh my God, I've seen that, I've done that, I've said that. Got it? And, we'll, and we laugh at that because we recognize, oh, I never thought about that. Wow, that's so funny, I do the same thing. So recognition, very powerful, very simple way to approach comedy. It also can be a hit and miss uh, type of material creator. Next thing's incongruity. Incongruity, what I love about incongruity, you can use it all day long, impose values or juxtapose contrasting elements or uh, take two clearly identifiable, by, identifiable ideas and converge them and then make a joke out of it and then do an act out and you've got uh, comedy. You see a lot of comics using this particular formula on David Letterman, uh, on The Late Shows, a uh, very common way to put together material. Uh, and when you break it down into those elements, it, it makes it very easy to write. We'll get into that a little later. Imposing the values of one thing onto another where it normally doesn't fit. Jerry Seinfeld uses this when he, when he personifies animals. For example, I was at the races the other day. I don't know if horses really know they're racing. I think horses are sitting there at the starting gate saying, I know there's a bag of oats at the end of this, and I want to get there first. So he imposes the values of human beings and human thought onto an animal rather than it's just being instinct, and now you have uh, a joke. So um, incongruity, very powerful technique. Next is superiority. We can use that by hitting self-deprecation and making the audience feel superior over us or picking on an authority, Congress, the president, cops, teachers, in-laws. We pick on a, an authority and then the audience feels superior because they've wanted to do the same thing. So superiority is big as well. Release. Release is where you begin to talk about a subject that could create tension in the audience, and then they realize it's completely benign. It releases the tension. Often that's followed by applause. After release is configurational. I love configurational because the gurus, Melvin Hellitzer and Gene Parrott, both said that configurational comedy is not utilized in commercially acceptable comedy today. Ha! Really? Configurational means you have to configure or think of the ending or piece together the joke. Mitch Hedberg, Stephen Wright, anybody? Both of these guys are configurational comics. Very powerful tool and it is acceptable in commercially uh, used comedy today. Uh, just think of sitcoms where you let the audience finish the ending of the joke or you say something and then the audience has to sort of solve that puzzle. Like if I said to you, uh, my wife's name is Jerry and my name is Jerry, makes it very confusing, but uh, we're re uh, sex is uh, fun, we're reciprocal in bed, we're like, re okay, we're like reciprocal fractions in bed, Jerry over Jerry or Jerry over Jerry, either way the results are the same. Now, if I do this joke correctly, and I say, <laughs> rather than messing it up like I just did, if I say to you, uh, in bed, we're configurational, 
We're configuring, oh, in, in bed we're reciprocal fractions, jerry over jerry or jerry over jerry. Either way, the results are the same. If I take my time and pause, and I do this in a late night show, those pauses would generate laughter and applause because the audience is configuring what I mean by reciprocal fractions. Right? All the results are the same. Got it. All right. So we understand a configurational edit to a certain extent. When, uh, when Stephen Wright says, I spilled spot remover on my dog, now he's gone. We have to sort of piece that together. It's a double entendre joke, but we have to piece together spot remover, spot remover, it remove the dog. The audience has to solve that little puzzle. We love to participate at that level to solve a puzzle. In, in configurational material can be very effective. After configurational, there is ambivalence. Ambivalence is a great laughter trigger. We're supposed to care about something but don't. I remember the good old days when kids worked in factories. Ambivalence. Uh, I can say this, you know, you know what my baby loves to play with? Chest hair. And she'll really yank on it too. It, sometimes it hurts. Finally, I had to say to my wife, you know, you might want to get that shit lasered. Aha. I'm supposed to care that my wife has a hairy chest and not really bring that up and, and make fun of it. But instead, it's ambivalent, plus there's surprise because I made you think it was my chest hair, not hers. Uh, and now you have a joke from that. Got it? So we have the eight laughter triggers, surprise, uh, embarrassment, recognition, incongruity, superiority, release, configurational, and ambivalence. Now that you have eight laughter triggers, now you have tools that you can use to actually attack humor from a totally different way. I'll give you an idea of how that worked, like I said earlier. I was sitting in a radio uh, studio in Denver, Colorado, getting ready to do a show that night, and we were pitching the show. Uh, during the break, they go to the news, and at the news, before they come back to us in the studio, they did a fluff piece, and the lady goes, you know, there's, um, there's a lot of phobias. There's actually a fear of having something to your left side. It's called sinistrophobia. So I'm thinking in my brain about this, and she goes, "There's a fear to have uh, of having. There's a fear of something having something to your right side called dextrophobia." And in using a three-way buildup or a triple, which is a part of the twelve joke structures uh, that I have in my ebook, uh, then she says, "So I'm thinking. There's. She gave me two. All I need is a third one that's a little high, heightened or exaggerated, and still relating to the subject matter we're talking about, phobias." And what would that work? So my mind went really quickly through the eight laughter triggers at a psychological level. I landed on embarrassment. That's pretty easy. Embarrassment, that would be behind you. And I just said the setup. What would be the fear of having something behind you? And when I said that setup, what came to my mind was, what would they call that? Homophobia? And what that triggered was a big laugh in the studio. And because it was also surprising, I would come up with something that quickly. And the guy who was booking me for the show out there in Denver was like, oh, my God, you're a genius. And I'm thinking to myself, I wasn't a genius. She basically wrote the joke. I just came up with the ending, went through, hit embarrassment, because I know that's a laughter trigger, and uh, hit the word homophobia, which relates to the phobias that we were talking about. And you have a joke. And I didn't tell him that I, I wasn't, I didn't tell him that it was easy, it wasn't genius. I let him think I was a genius so he would make sure he wanted to hire me again. But just by having these laughter triggers available to me in that moment in the studio, I was able to come up with a joke like that, therefore impressing the people I was working for and getting a laugh in the studio, which was my job because, after all, uh, I was a comedian on the radio. But... So now that you understand these eight laughter triggers, if you want more in-depth coverage on these triggers, just uh, you know, visit the link below and go ahead and, and download the ebook. Get the ebook. Um, it's filled with tools, and I assure you, if you follow these these tips and tricks and exercises that are in the ebook, you're going to be a far better comedy writer than you are right now. Even if you've been doing this for many years, most of the guys I know who have been doing this for 11 years. Get, uh, have come to my courses and checked out the ebook and gone, holy crap, dude, I've learned so much more. I'm now more of a writer than I was a coincidental comic just waiting for things to happen. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any questions, man, please drop me some comments or uh, shoot me an email. Even if you disagree, I would love to. Maybe you can prove me wrong in something. Maybe I learned something from you. I always love that conversation. Um, it's always fun to talk about comedy. Or meet me on Google Places and let's do a hangout and let's debate it. 
That would be fun. And everybody else and other people can get involved. That's always a good time. All right, I'll talk to you soon. Hope you enjoy the video. My name is Jerry. See you later. Bye.